Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. I'm a rock star. You're a rock star. We are rock stars. Everybody rock. Ever since I started making movies, I've wanted to divide the audience and have people love the movie or hate the movie and walk out after 10 minutes. I'm hungry. Hey, lady, down in front. Oh, it. Hey, excuse me. Watch hey, out. Excuse me. But I don't like it right in the middle where it's apathy. People feel it's OK. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad. I think life is short, and especially with artwork, I really want to get a reaction out of people. So that's sort of how I've started out making movies and I'm still making movies that way, trying to get a reaction. People love the movie, people hate the movie. I think a lot of movies are, you know, especially bigger budget movies are maybe made by too many people, too many opinions, too many questions to the audience to vote on which ending they like the best. And to me, it reads more like a commercial for the general public. And so I, I really want to push buttons and just get a response, an honest response from people. And again, uh, whether you love or hate the movies, I'm delighted. I want to get people reacting one way or the other. <laughs> Lenny got me an audition. It's for the female lead in the film version of Cats. Ha, this is so wonderful. Now where's that phone? I've got to call my acting coach and schedule a refresher session ASAP. But first, some marijuana. I think there also are certain themes and cool things going on in the world that we don't even know, can't even understand, but sort of like the magic of life. And I try to incorporate this stuff into filmmaking. Uh, I think it's just sort of cool stuff, interesting stuff. And I do like movies that sort of embrace this world that we don't see maybe we feel but we don't know if it's really out there you know all these weird elements you know even the idea of like alternate realities twins who can communicate with each other it's it could be real i don't know but it's stuff that i'd like to explore in movies it's again the magic of the world and magic of filmmaking i think that's the way to do it you know maybe you have a small thing in your life that affected you that changed your life that was crazy and mysterious and as a filmmaker what you can do is take the small moment in your life and blow it up into a scene, into a character, into a movie for the world to see. Sort of like sharing a small part of yourself, but sharing in a really conventional, easy to understand way. Ah! Fuck you, I'm not gonna do this. This place is fucking disgusting. I'm gonna puke, it smells like cat piss. It's gross. I would say that my aesthetic is gonna be like the rainbow, you know, like the grilled cheese sandwich, but it's all different colors, mixed with the blood, mixed with the tits, mixed with the glitter. So it's almost like psychedelic, disgusting, like, um, like Icha. My dismal life has no meaning. Soon I will end this wretched existence and shrug off the mortal coil. Misery is my sole companion, so let the curtains fall where they may. Stop! What are you doing? I'm acting. But why must you speak in such a monotone? I don't speak in a monotone. Yes, you do! Well, you're the professional actor. Whatever you say must be right. It's like a car crash in slow motion. But hopefully there's pathos behind it. And there's real human things that we have to go through. And it's not just glitter and like a fashion ad. You don't want a fashion ad. The fashion line, J, the fashion line. Get me a model and give me a presentation in 15 minutes. Chop, chop. When Dom is describing a film as making a meal and editing, you know, making a meal and you want it to taste good and you want people to remember it, I also think you want people to get a little sick. Like, I don't know if I can eat that every day or every year, maybe every decade, but I feel a little uncomfortable, but it tasted good and I'm remembering it.
every movie has to be as good as Mod Fuck Explosion. And they're they're not. <laughs> they're not because Mod Fuck Explosion was innocent. And I was 24. I think Don was like 28. I mean, that's not that young. A is for acne. B is for body odor. C, comics and cigarettes. D, death. <laughs> I like the idea of narrative and that there are certain rules you have to follow, but I also like the idea of doing very unconventional narratives. I also do like the idea of completely ignoring story, narrative, character development, plot, anything like this. I sometimes like to ignore it completely and just create a movie, create some scenes that are sheer spectacle. So it's light, sound, images and it doesn't have to make sense intellectually but it, it could be thrilling at the same time almost like a, a punk or hardcore show you go to see the show see the band it doesn't make sense but it's completely overwhelming and just you know for your ears and your eyes it's overwhelming such a beautiful place all those young boys smacking up against puberty with both testicles Mockbook Explosion has a narrative, and to me, Mockbook Explosion was a perfect balance between the narrative and just the sheer spectacle of filmmaking. And then you might have a movie like uh, Hippie Porn or even My Degeneration where it becomes a little more experimental. Mommy Mommy Where's My Brain, one of my early shorts. Uh, not much narrative flow, but uh, I think it needed a little bit more. So for me, Mockbook Explosion was the culmination of uh, right amount of narrative and the right amount of uh, sheer spectacle. C combine them and you have something that's really interesting, fun to watch, fun to follow, but not necessarily making sense all the time. Damn it, I thought it was my tax guys. Hey, I didn't order any Chinese takeout today. You boys must have the wrong address. Sophie, this is Greenberg and Greenberg. Hi, I'm Greenberg. And this is Greenberg. Oops. I think humor is so important in movies. Uh, the problem I have with a lot of movies is uh, there is no sense of humor. And I'm not talking about jokes like, you know, jokes that just make us laugh on the surface. To me, the best humor is the, the deepest stuff that maybe we laugh at, but it makes us nervous. It makes us sick in the stomach. And so for me, as far as humor, uh, I found the best way to do humor is to expose my faults and problems and mistakes through my characters and through the movie, uh, the best humor I've found is me looking in a mirror and laughing at myself and then using this in a movie. I, I'd rather laugh at myself and address these defects that I have than laugh at someone else. So yeah, I think the deepest humor in a movie is the most uncomfortable humor and it also makes the audience uh, maybe look in a mirror and look at their faults, look at their shortcomings, and maybe laugh nervously at what's wrong with them. That's a toy! This sucks. I think editing, it's sort of like uh, cooking, where uh, you want it to taste good, you want it to be very delicious, but you maybe want it to be healthy at the same time, and then you also want it to be fresh. You have, you're balancing all these elements. With editing, uh, one thing I've found is uh, every scene has an emotion and it has an emotion written into it. It has an emotion that the actors are portraying and the editing has to respect that emotion. So that's the first thing. Second is uh, there's a story and if it's not edited well, you lose the story, you lose the characters. So it has to make sense. And then the third one is just like the pure rock and roll. I mean, I want the certain cuts to be shocking, jarring, exciting and that's where you get really creative so it's a combination of all three elements and it's balancing them in certain scenes you might have to be completely shocking 
forget the story. Others, you might have to tell the story more traditionally, but it, it is all three to me, and you've got to balance them all out. Pump, pout, prance, primp, pose, bump, grind, shimmy, shake, and practice, practice, practice. The key to editing is uh, following the storyline, following the characters, following the narrative so it makes sense, but the most spectacular editing doesn't make sense. It's thinking outside the box, and honestly, that's the stuff I have the biggest problems with, and that's where Amy can help me because she definitely is a really creative thinker. So she'll watch a scene, and I've cut it, dialogue, one character, the other character. It makes sense, and she'll look at it and say, this doesn't work. Why don't you get rid of that dialogue, put this line at the beginning, put this at the end, and she really sort of thinks in a very fluid state that uh, really is quite creative and that's that's really the, the help I need because I can do the technical, I can make the story make sense in the brain, but sometimes the way she creates things is more for the heart, for the emotion, for the shock, and uh, that's that's where the, I think the real genius comes in. Baby, I'm a fake whore. Can't you give me more, more, more? I won't stop now till I win that race and the fucking paparazzi memorize first and foremost, a video artist. But if there's a camera around, then I've got the smile. Baby, I'm a fame whore. And a performance artist. I always want more, more, more. Baby, I'm a fame whore. For the rough cut, it's just follow the script, word for word, scene for scene, make it follow the script, and then you sit down and we watch the rough cut and we realize this is shit. This doesn't work. What do we do now? And that's where you start cutting in the dialogue, editing out dialogue, changing the story, putting the beginning scene at the end of the movie, really moving things around. And that's where you're, for me, that's where the real filmmaking comes in. Finish the edit, lock the picture, and then you create the soundscape, the soundtrack. And again, Amy has a really good ear. She comes from a really musical family. So she's sort of able to gauge what scenes need, you know, what type of music, what type of sound effects. So she's really, really great for the music, sound design, and as well as color grading, color correction, she also is like a very good visual sense as an artist, so she can see the nuances and get the skin tone right or get the sky right. So yeah, but basically it's just the two of us. Uh, I've worked with editors before and it's sometimes hard to get the movie you want when someone else is there sort of in between you and the movie doing what they want to do. Sometimes these editors listen to the producer and they don't listen to me. So I found that the editor is God. Editor creates the soul and the spirit of the movie and that's why I've got to be there editing. It's, it's to me the most important job. <laughs> Music is so important for me. I mean, they say a movie is 50% music, 50% imagery, and I feel sometimes when my movies go to 90% music, that's where the strength is, and 10% what you're watching. Uh, I like to use music to uh, accent a scene, to uh, push the emotions, to create the moods, to uh, reinforce the moods, but a lot of times I'll choose the music first, even before. I even have written the movie, I'll have certain songs that make me feel a certain way and I'll hold on to this song and this feeling and I'll eventually create a scene in the movie where it, the, the scene becomes an embodiment for that feeling and that song. So the music comes first a lot of the time. It's all of those, I mean I've worked with composers, I've used my, our band's music, I've used friends' music and then sometimes it's just music I hear out there and a, I write to the artist and uh, try to get the permission. I mean, it, it can come from anywhere. What I'll do when I'm working with the composer is I'll actually show them the scene, the movie, so that they understand what they're working on. And I'll also have like instructions, or it, it comes down to emotions and moods. So we have the scene, and these are the feelings behind it. These are the feelings we're trying to convey. And now it's up to you to take these descriptions, watch the scene, and see what you, what you can come up with. And, Honestly, sometimes this absolutely doesn't work. You give them the instructions, they watch the scene, and they come up with something that, that's terrible or just doesn't work for it. So that's sometimes sort of hard. I found that uh, 
there is a lot of music out there and for every scene I've created, there already exists music that someone else has created maybe yesterday or a week ago or 200 years ago that works for the scene. So it really isn't that big an issue if I'm not working with a composer, you know? Not, not only music, but just, I, I think there's a music and sounds. So certain sound effects are just, you have to get the right sound effect. You have to get the right ambient tone. You have to get the right background sounds. I think these things are really, really important. I love creating soundscapes and sound design and almost like creating a whole environment of the movie just for your ears to listen to. It really, really goes far. So yeah, this is all really, really important stuff for me. You know, I've, I ha I've never had a huge, giant budget, but I've had sort of medium budgets and really like low, no budgets. Obviously the money is gonna affect the movie, the equipment you use, how you shoot it, but sometimes uh, these limitations cause you to be more creative and might create a better movie. One example is my movie Scum Rock from 2003, 2004, where I had a really hot shit, really great producer in Hollywood. And uh, my movie before was an Oscar contender. And so we said, you know, with this new movie, Fame Whore, or I mean Scum Rock, we're gonna be able to get at least a million dollars. So we tried to get a million dollars to shoot it on 35 millimeter, but that didn't work out. So we scaled it to $50,000 for 16 millimeter, and that didn't work. And this took about a year and we're, not making the movie and Amy finally said, hey John, we, we should just do the money with our own, do the movie with our own money and just use the camcorder my mom got us. So we ended up shooting the feature for $5,000 on a little consumer camcorder. And the movie looks really, really weird and great. And I think it's one of those examples where the limitation of the money pushed us to uh, try a very radical way of making a movie, but it really created a, interesting, really different type of movie. So, you know, a lot of times these limitations, lack of money, lack of equipment, lack of a crew, they can push you to come up with some very imaginative solutions that you might not have tried before. And I think when you're taking these chances and risks, going for it, you don't quite know if you can do it. Sometimes you can produce really great work out of it. Do you know what time it is? Um, no, sorry. Hey, I uh, really like your hair. As far as making a movie, I mean, obviously you need a certain amount of money, but I think another key to filmmaking is getting support from the film scene. And so for this new movie, uh, nobody got paid and we had an exceptional cast and crew, a lot of very professional people who said, I'm not gonna work on the Coen Brothers new movie, movie for pay, but I'm gonna come to your movie and work for free. So the experience and just the good vibes and just, you know, just the way we were making the movie. So as much as, you know, maybe you're not getting money from the government or people out in your, your community, I think there are other ways to get support, you know, to make a movie. I like every way of screening. I like big movie theaters. I like small rock and roll clubs, small movie theaters, micro cinemas, art galleries, streaming video, VHS, DVD, I, I love it all. I think, a, I think a good movie will transcend the format and the way it's projected or who sees it. And when I started out making movies, I always said I wanted to make movies for different groups of people. So for the teenagers, for middle-aged people, for older people, for punk rockers, for people who like classical music. And I, I've always wanted to make movies that would appeal to not only the underground and scummy, scuzzy stuff, people people in different scenes, but also to the very fine art, high art uh, crowds. I've always wanted to make movies that could almost speak these different languages and speak to different audiences. You know, uh, the best, most successful screening has been in New York City at the Ramekin Crucible last year. And uh, what we ended up doing is projecting seven features at the same time overlapping on all the walls of the space. It was overwhelming because the projections were huge, 20, 30 feet. Uh, and we also had all seven soundtracks playing at the same time through a really good sound system. So 
it was a spectacle. It was completely overwhelming. You walk into the space and you see a collision of different movies from different time periods. You see some of the same actors, but 20 years difference in age. Uh, lots of noise, lots of sound. It was completely overwhelming and beautiful. And uh, the strange thing about the show was it also was very calming and peaceful. I thought it would be a very hard to watch, hard to take. I thought people would come in and leave after two minutes because it was it would be too much stimulation. But it was it was the exact opposite. It was almost like a form of meditation. And I found myself sitting in the gallery for an hour at a time, watching and absorbing. It was almost like being in a a bath, being in nature. I don't know what I I don't know what to compare it to, but it was very peaceful and people would come in and watch the movies for 45 minutes and watch all seven of them at the same time seven soundtracks uh it was a pretty amazing spectacle and uh this is the way i like to continue uh presenting my movies in galleries it's not on a little monitor not one movie at a time but some type of almost like a performance piece where the uh, each movie is a performer and all together they create a larger work different in that uh, for the previous movies a lot of them you know the early ones were shot in 16 millimeter then it transitioned to analog high 8 video mini DV uh, sort of lo-fi do-it-yourself types of filmmaking and for this one I said you know the challenge for me it would be really easy to go out and make another movie mini DV or, you know, analog video. For me, the challenge is to uh, embrace a professional uh, format. So this was all shot on a 4K RAW, which is incredibly, you know, a, a very incredibly like high-end type of situation. And it was a big challenge and I initially didn't want to do this. And uh, my director of photography encouraged me. She just said, let's just try to get the best equipment we possibly can. I definitely, realized as a producer, I never want to do that again. And it made me a better actor because I didn't pull any of that starfish shit on set. And I was, it didn't matter what I looked like. It was like, get the shot, move on, get the shot, move on, do a good job. So it helped me, but it was like trial by fire. So this one I didn't have to produce, thank God. I just did the costume, did all the other stuff we do. We do a lot, I guess, but I could just focus on the acting. The only problem with this one was it was playing twins, so it was kind of scattered. And then, you know, when people don't let you have enough time to do hair and makeup. F. Fuck. Fucking fucked up and fucked over. And they, you know, that kind of shit. So there was one star fit on set. I scared the crew, but that's okay. I wanted to create a movie where almost like the environment is another character. And by creating an environment like this, with cool shit like for instance, that, or that, uh, you can't place it, you don't know what reality it is, and uh, the artist also uh, creates these landscapes where we don't know what country it is. Is that China? Is this movie taking place in China, or is that Turkey, or, you know, is this... America, and I think that's one of the beauties of a timeless film, a film that will last forever, is when you can't say, that's 2018 in San Francisco, California, with this type of landscape, uh, I want it to look like it's perhaps in the future, perhaps in the past, perhaps right now, is it Europe, is it South America, is it Mexico, is it Asia, we don't know, and I think that not only... Uh, is really interesting for the audience, really interesting for the story, but it creates a movie that maybe people can, uh, when, when you don't link a movie to a specific place or time, I think it allows you to uh, 
look at the themes and the emotions and what the characters are going through a little more deeply instead of saying, well, this is 2018 and America has crazy things going on and blah, blah, blah. It's really easy to sometimes dismiss or forget about the motivations of the characters. And with a movie set like this, it becomes more about universal human needs and emotions and feelings. For this movie, for the story, the characters, all the exterior wide shots are these landscapes on a green screen. Uh, and there's like, we sort of saw the element of that thing, skull fuck. What is skull fuck? Skull fuck is a, it's a drug. It's a way of altering your mind, but the characters get hooked on this drug. And it basically is a way to enter a portal to another dimension where you sort of live an idealized life for 15 minutes. So when people get skull fucked and they enter their idealized life, they will enter a world where we escape this urban craziness, and it becomes almost like minimalist natural landscapes, more nature, beautiful buildings, beautiful colors, beautiful light. And so you get skull fucked, and for 15 minutes, you are your idealized self. You've reached full potential in this beautiful environment. And then after 15 minutes, you get thrown back into this crap right here in the gutter, in the puddle of, of sewage right there. And uh, the problem with Skullfuck is each time you do it, your life slowly decreases until you eventually disappear. So there is an element of characters actually entering a reality that we maybe appreciate, but it's going to be really idealized, really beautiful, gorgeous rainbows and light and holograms and just all this cool shit going on. So this is scene 17 with uh, Max Sanders and James Duvall, who was Frank the Bunny in Donnie Darko, and uh, this is the green screen effect. So uh, it's shot against the green screen, and then we're going to drop in a background, which is going to be crazy Tracy Snelling artwork. It's crazy cool shit. Uh, here we go. So how's the show going? Are you going to blow our minds? Nixon? Shut up. Is this the magnum opus? Your grand comeback? What is this? Skullfuck? Skull. Trust me. Let's get skull fucked now. All right, here's the magic cool shit up, and this is going to be the background. So they're going to be talking right in front there. So uh, Tracy Snelling is an artist. She does these amazing, crazy background, so we're going to use things like that as a setting, that, characters walking through it, characters walking into the door, things like that. So it's going to be this crazy landscape of this artwork with the actual actors moving against it. Numbskull revolution and the humor, especially fine art, conceptual art, it was sort of two things I wanted to do. One was uh, make fun of the whole scene. Uh, I went to a college where we really studied this thing called semiotics, which is conceptual theory. And before you can even make a movie, you have to be able to write the theory about it and know these philosophers and modern theorists and all this crap. And so I wanted to make fun of this whole way people maybe spend a lot of time thinking and not creating. So that was one thing I wanted to do with the movie. But the other thing I wanted to do was sort of get into the psyche and the uh, sickness of being an artist, how as an artist you're obsessed. We become obsessed. That's all we talk about. That's how we live and breathe. And it's a real problem. We almost stop being human because we're so involved with our art. And I wanted to sort of capture this and show it to the audience and 
not only a realistic way, but in a humorous way, because for me, that's sort of exposing myself to the world. I've had problems in my life just because I've become too wrapped up in my art, where I've lost track of my feelings or life or reality going on around me. So that was one thing I wanted to do. As much as it's a serious problem, it's sort of funny and weird and strange. So I wanted to put this into the characters in the movie and sort of expose myself. You know, I'm making fun of artists in this movie, but I'm, I'm an artist too, so I'm making fun of myself. The art scene is completely conceptual and uh, the movie is about two characters who are the top artists in the world. And both of them are conceptual artists who create nothing. Like that's their art, nothing. And uh, once again, I wanted to just show the whole folly of art, of creation, of making stuff. And what if an artist spent their life making art, but the art was nothing. It was air, it was invisible. You couldn't look at it or experience it. That's, you know, what the movie's about. Artists who create nothing. Baby, baby, I just called to tell you how much fun I had in your bathroom this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, me too, you know. Holly, listen, I'm taking a little trip to New York with the Big Apple. I wanted you to come with me. The message of all my movies, I think there is one general message, which is we are all flawed and you have to look in the mirror and face these flaws, face on, head on. We are all flawed, we all have problems, we have to look in the mirror and address these problems. That, that's the big message. Every movie, they have different themes, like teenagers or Asian Americans or, you know, rock and roll. But the big underlying message is we are imperfect. And those of us who think we're perfect are shit. So we've got to look in the mirror, face these imperfections.